out on this. They're great. Thank you. Uh, item 9.3, safe schools and security okay. update. It's an information <laughs> item with a 10 minute presentation and a 20 minute discussion. Teresa Cummings, Tracy Lopez, and Lieutenant Lisa Hines. I'll stay up here and not ask you to take action. It's just <laughs> information only. <laughs> President Cuneo, Superintendent Raymond, and board members, thank you for the opportunity to come before you this evening. My name is Teresa Cummings. I'm here with Lieutenant Lisa Hines and Tracy Lopez, our Safe Schools and Security Services Manager. Tonight we will be updating you on what we are doing to ensure that Sac City Unified School District is providing a safe and secure learning environment. Sac City Unified School District has a fundamental responsibility, an ethical and a legal responsibility to provide a safe educational environment for our students, our family, and our staff. We also have a responsibility to the taxpayers, our neighborhoods, and our students to ensure our facilities are maintained in an order to provide a safe and healthy learning environment. At this time, I'd like to introduce Tracy Lopez, and she will be going over what we're doing in Sac City. Here, I'll leave that with you, or I'll you want to do it for me? Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Teresa, Pre President, President Cuneo, Superintendent Raymond. I was all ready for that. And the rest of the <laughs> And board members. I, too, thank you for the opportunity to come before you this evening. It is our intention to up update you on what we are doing in the school district in the area of safety and security. Providing a safe and secure learning environment requires a variety of components, from the protection of our sites and properties after hours to the safety provided to our students, staff, families by district staff, and law enforcement partners who are on our campuses daily. Our team provides safety and security to our district 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We all know it takes an entire community to keep our students and staff safe. We rely on our partners to sit on our committees, to volunteer on our campuses, and work with us to achieve our mutual goals. Our district strives to nourish current partnerships as well as cultivate new ones. Law enforcement continues to play a significant role in our overall safety and security. Our partnerships allow us to do more with less, maximizing and sustaining our efforts. Partners bring additional knowledge and views to provide a broader perspective on issues and solutions. You will see shortly some examples of our partnerships at work. Safety assessments were done on all of our campuses in December of 2010. One of the outcomes of those assessments were upgrades to camera systems and lighting. The Safe Schools Office is committed to providing support to all of our principals to make sure the highest degree of training exists. We continually assess and reassess our practices in real time and judge them against best practice strategies. As we look for the best ways to promote and provide safe learning environments for staff and students, we look to best practices to help guide our decisions and actions. Among the agencies we look to are the Federal Emergency Management Agency, the California Emergency Management Agency, local and federal law enforcement, the California Department of Education, California School Boards, the Coalition for Adequate School Housing, and of course, other school districts. The Sacramento City Unified School District Safety Committee was reconvened after the tragedy in Newtown, Connecticut. The committee is made up of a broad group of stakeholders. Members reflect our community. It includes parents, staff, students, law enforcement, the fire department, emergency communications personnel, as well as the community at large. The intent of the committee is to provide Sacramento City Unified School District with input and feedback on district-wide safety issues. State law mandates all schools submit a annual safe school report. I'm sorry, a safe school plan. Plans address school culture and climate 
as well as the physical plant itself. In addition to procedures related to bullying, I'm sorry, in addition, procedures related to bullying must also be included in that plan. Each site must have their plan approved by their safety committee and be available for public viewing. The Sacramento City Unified School District Safety Committee will be reviewing the safe school plan. We'll be asking the group for recommendations on how these plans can be improved. Items to be considered will include supplemental emergency procedures and a revised submission time. In addition to the efforts of the Safe School Office and security services, our schools are engaged on a daily basis in activities and programs that help educate our students on a variety of safety issues. Our department has an acute focus that all students and families displaced by school closures are safe and cared for during the transition to their new schools. Our efforts include identifying walking routes to receiving school sites. Walking maps will be provided to families and will include safe walking information endorsed by the California Department of Public Health. We will be utilizing information from SAC PD, the Sheriff's Department, and the California Highway Patrol to determine bus pickup and drop off locations. We are also working with the City of Sacramento and Walk Sacramento to provide pedestrian safety assemblies for all closing and receiving sites. We continue to gather feedback from our partners and community members on this topic. Our close collaboration with law enforcement partners maximizes our resources. While we're talking about eight contracted school resource officers, we're actually getting an entire department if needed. Sacramento Sheriff's Department has adopted our schools in the unincorporated area of Sacramento. Those officers are frequently on those campuses in much more than a law enforcement role. And in talking about resources, Grant funding has allowed us to provide resources and programming we would otherwise be unable to provide. Grants have provided over $1 million worth of programming in the last three years. One of those grants, the Readiness and Emergency Management in Schools grant, also referred to as REMS, has a sunset date this summer, August 2013. It's provided funding for extensive training, equipment, and staffing. We recently found out that we will also be receiving additional funding for gang violence prevention intervention through 2015. An example of the type of activities this grant promotes is after school football at Will C. Wood and the gang violence prevention intervention specialist at McClatchy High School participates in the Men's Leadership Academy. The Secure Our Schools grant, which is funded by the Federal Community-Oriented Policing Program, also known as Secure Our Schools, is funding curtains and additional camera upgrades at sites. The It's Up to All of Us grant, which is funded through the California Department of Public Health, is funding pedestrian safety assemblies at closing sites and walk audits. The Office of Traffic Safety, a grant, will provide one full-time school resource officer for traffic-related issues district-wide. Announcement of this grant should come to us in 2013. We know that all of our sites are committed to the highest level of safety. As you know, there are varying degrees of experience, not only with staff, but with principals as well. As an example, we have principals who have been leaders for decades and others who have just been appointed to their first principalship tonight. The Safe Schools Office will be providing support to all of our principals to make sure the highest degree of consistent practices exists. Training continues to be an integral part in preparing for and responding to emergencies. We also utilize training to provide overall strategies for campus safety. 
Violent intruder strategies train the trainer was conducted to sustain information and provide refreshers down the road for staff, both current and new. In addition to the train the trainer workshop, we're providing violent intruder training for all of our administrators and campus monitors, as well as office managers, teachers, school plant operations managers, custodians, nutrition staff, and other key personnel, including volunteers. We're going to be creating a training video for parents to provide information on what to do if the unexpected happens. A longer version of that training video will show what we do during a lockdown and in or intruder event. All trainings listed on our PowerPoint have been ongoing. Many have occurred this year and will continue to occur. Sacramento City Unified School District and the Safe Schools Office will continue to assess and reassess our practices in relation to the safety and security of our students, staff, and families. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. While most believe that the fundamental mission of K-12 education is to educate our children, to a parent, to everyone in this room, to our community, we know, I know, as the mother of a Sac City Unified School District student and the wife of a Sac City Unified School District teacher, that there's absolutely nothing more important than the safety of our children and our adults on our campuses. We are here to answer any questions. We have Lieutenant Hines, if you have any specific questions for her, and Tracy Lopez and myself can answer any questions or concerns that you might have. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll have a public comment first. Oh, sure. We have three public comments from Leo bennett Cauchon, Jessica Ariaga, and Darlene Anderson. Gonna work or yeah, okay. Sorry. Didn't know if you do too. Safety is a collaborative effort. I've worked many programs in inner cities and appreciate the presentation and the work that our frontline people do, but I know the policy setters also have a lot. And I'm here to tell you that you can't make safe schools when you do what you're doing you will traumatize some kid for sure. The research says that's inevitable. A safety word is first do no harm. You are doing harm, and you're not looking at some of it. You're taking a school like Ethel Phillips, which has never had the capacity that you're going to put into it. It peaked at 550, and you're going to put 650 kids there. How are you going to keep it safe? When your million-dollar facility plan already states that it's below the standard in terms of size for its existing population, the drop-off area is very congested and hazard, and that that's an unsafe environment for children. You task people too much with this policy change. And has been shared, all you need to do is have principals walk, and they can be a lot safer. We're talking about walking with crossing guards. That was investigated for the school last year, AWN. And it was stated that it may reduce the safety risks. They cannot, without certainty, resolve these risks. You didn't have bus service last year. For somehow magic, even though we're in a fiscal crisis, it's come back, except for our good friends at CB Wire, all of whom will be walking. How will you possibly mitigate their safety risks unless something has changed? Overall, you're creating seven educational deserts by closing these schools. And we've talked about this over and over again. This is the crime density map for Sacramento City. Our schools cover the county as well. I've estimated where our closed sites are. Just like with the poverty impact, they overlap. I've also been asked to generate Megan's Law. They also overlap. 
again, in my opinion, in too many years on inner city streets working with homeless populations, you are overtasking. Perhaps you need to triple her department. Thank you. Oh, and I just thought that it really good visual was shown and that we need to keep thinking about it because these targeted schools overlap with every safety variable. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jessica Ariaga. Um, I have a couple of things that I wanted to bring up. Um, I know I've spoken about this before, and I don't know if there has been any changes or any plans. Um, Earl Warren has a very open front entrance where parents can walk up, and anyone can walk onto the campus at any given hour. That's pretty much out of sight. So any, I am very uncomfortable with not being able to visually see who may be stepping onto my child's campus. So I do, I haven't heard anything back as to if there's any plans on securing that front entrance at all. So that's a huge safety concern of mine, and it's been on the PTA safety issues for quite some time. So I think it's time that we address that issue. Um, the second thing is um, when it comes to transportation and safety, um, although I appreciate all the hard work, I would really like to know how far along those plans are. Where are those plans? Because as of April 10th, this is what was handed to my children during the PTA meeting. And you'll see that it includes, sorry, you'll see that it includes one mutual drop-off for all students to be dropped off at Peter Burnett. So this was as of April 10th after the superintendent reassured me that this was not going to be the plan. So if this is being passed out to parents and this plan is scrapped, how far along are you in the new transportation plan? I understand that this is a very sensitive issue and that we're going to want to spend as much time as we can in ensuring children's safety, but you have put us, because of the short amount of time, of these school closures, we're on a time restraint. We don't have a whole lot of time. We've asked and we've begged for more time for planning. So if you're at the beginning stages of a transportation pickup and drop off plan, that concerns me. I want some dates as to when I can see as a parent these pickup and drop off points so that I can ensure and reassure my fellow parents and colleagues that their children will be safe. Because until I see something tangible, I have no comfort, and I do appreciate your partnerships with the police and law enforcement because I do feel that they will advocate and make sure that something like this doesn't come into fruition, but I really would like to see some true deadline dates as to when we can see as parents where, these, where our children will be dropping off and when they'll be picked up and when we can expect them home. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good evening, Darlene Anderson. I come with you, I guess, with a, to, to you tonight with a heavy heart, simply because I really understand what this district has done over the last 20 years. They have created separate and unequal educational options for African-American children and Latino children. I say that because the district has created and solidified the services offered through the SARB. And the SARB is a student in attendance review board, it is not, and has never been given the authority to do placement, yet they move children and they say that it's a volunteer process from parents. How is it that it becomes a volunteer process when you have the district attorney and the welfare office included? It is not volunteer. And the district may say, well, we've done such a great job in graduating more African-American children. Well, let me tell you, Credit recovery, when a child has never, ever attended Kennedy, Johnson, or Luther Burbank, ever, but they walked with those students and graduated and were given high school diplomas from those comprehensive high schools where they were denied access. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about access and equality. We're talking about a fate. We're talking about the right to a free and appropriate public education, which has been denied from this district for children of color. And I'm telling you, I filed a uniform complaint, and I'm trying to understand the process. I thought that you were having behavior hearings. 
under special ed. Turns out, no, that's not what's happening. You are having SARDs and informing the parents they have a choice. What is a choice when you have the police, the DA, CPS, and a group of people who will chastise families? It's not a choice. It becomes a decision families make so that they do not get caught up in law enforcement. I'm working with community members, real people in the community members, and there will be more of us when we come to meet with your staff again. And I would hope that you have qualified staff in the room to address the issues because I have talked with LA Unified SARB and the County SARB in Los Angeles County, and they told me that they do not have as many people as you have under contracts with the SARB office, nor do they have as many children in the alternative programs. And I'm saying tonight that you are accountable as a board and can be held liable as board members for denying an educational option to children who have a right to a free and appropriate public accommodation, which is a service that their families pay taxes for. Thank you. Member Pritchett. Thank you, President Cuno, um, and thank you for your presentation and coming here tonight to um, give us some insight of what's being done in our district. Um, when I asked for this a while um, ago to be put on the agenda, I had some kind of key things that I wanted to touch on, so I'll just kind of go through what, what I was thinking. Um, in regards to fire plans, when you're at a school, did you hear me? Fire, fire plans. Fire plans. Fire plans. Yeah. Sorry, you had that look on your face. Um, fire. <laughs> when I went to go visit some of the schools, that, uh, mainly ones that had portables, mm -hmm. I noticed that there was only one door in, one door out. Um, so when there's fire drills, are they to climb out a window as part of the drill? Do you know this? As far as I know, as, pa as part of the drill, they go out <laughs> to the door and they go to a pre-assigned location um, typically, those locations have been approved by either the city or the county, excuse me, <clears throat> Metro Fire. They have to be a certain number of feet away from the building. So what if there was a fire at the door? Like, <laughs> they would go out a window, right? It, but they don't have any training to go out the window. It would just be done at that moment and supervised by a teacher. Is that right? Yes. Okay. I just wanted to clarify because I noticed that when I was doing school tours. Good um, I wasn't sure. <laughs> Good observation. Um School resource officers. I know we, um, last year we had cut some of our school resources officers. Um, for I know in particular for my area, we had one at Einstein Middle School and we had one at Rosemont High School, and they're both very, very busy. Now we have one that covers that entire area. Um, do we foresee um, in the next school year that we will have additional school resource officers? That'll be a budget decision. That will be a, a budget discussion when we um, when we get into our recommendations. That's the place where we would be putting something like that. It is something that we are considering. Okay. Um, AED machines. Yes. Are they on each school campus? Actually, that is that's going to be a question better directed to health services. But it is my understanding that they have been removed from campuses because of training and upkeep. Okay. Did we reach out to training and upkeep? Did we reach out for training like through the um, Nurse Association or American Red Cross? I know that they offer free training for these machines. Certainly never an attempt to pass the buck. Um, but health services oversees the AED machines, and they'd be much more qualified than myself to answer that question for you. Okay. We can certainly get the information to you, and we can take care of that. These machines are just so important to have on our school sites. I know. Uh, especially those that have sports leagues. Correct. Um, on the sites. Um, you talked about training in the schools mm -hmm. for safety. I have a daughter at Rosemont High School, and if something happened at Rosemont High School, I have no idea what to do. I've never had a flyer come home, nothing, um, to tell me this is where you would pick up 
your child in case of emergency. So that's maybe something that you can work with the schools on Absolutely. getting the word out to parents, maybe through Connect Ed or something. Absolutely. We um, utilize Connect Ed a lot for emergency communications when yeah. we need to what, do them. Right. I've gotten them before, but, um, but in preparation yes. of something, if I saw on the news at work that something happened at the school, I'd be going crazy and driving up there as of every other parent. Right. And then you'd have overcrowding at the school of like these parents trying to flood in without the preparation of telling parents, look, stay put. This is where you're going to meet your child. Yep. That's so. exactly correct. And that's part of the information, maybe not the specifics about Rosemont, uh -huh. but that's the type of information that's going to be in that training video that I referenced in my presentation. I can't wait to see it. I can't <laughs> wait to do it. <laughs> um, the uh, Jessica Ariaga brought up Earl Warren, um, and she showed us a copy of the um, drop-off plan. Uh -huh. Is that something that we can get emailed to the board? Let me take that. Actually, and if I don't, if I'm not complete with my address on this, um, Teresa will definitely be able to fill in some blanks. But uh, work on the front of Earl Warren. Earl Warren, I'm sorry, is supposed to commence this summer. Okay, so that gate will be closed off, and um, Member Pritchett, yes. I, I can help a little bit. Um, that will be on the agenda the first meeting of May. Transition piece, including the busing. So I would expect okay. that the staff... But it's already gone out to parents, right? I'm just asking if it's gone out to parents and it should I'm probably not sure be about sent that, to but the I, board I, as well. I'm actually speaking to your concerns and, and we'll be discussing those concerns uh, and issues uh, the first the first meeting. In I understand what you're saying, um, but what I'm saying is that if, if it's already gone out to the parents, they're going to come to us, not just those that are on the executive committee asking for questions. And if we weren't emailed the documents... We have no idea how to answer them. So that's all I'm asking. If they've already gone out to the parents, just please email them to the board so that way we know what they're talking about. And just from a safety perspective, we are working with the principal and maintenance and operations staff is working with restriping and redesigning their front parking lot. Okay. And that will be done this summer. Thank you again mm -hmm. for coming out and doing this presentation. I really do appreciate it. Member Royal. Thank you, President Cuneo. I do have a few questions. Um, one of them, I'll start off as I kind of numbered in here, and it's um, on the technology piece. Um, wanted to know if there is a um, plan uh, that has been laid out as to uh, how we're going to uh, deal with the technology piece. I know that um, um, we are going through, uh, well, seven Campuses are due to be closed, right? Uh, but we have um, aging technology. We, uh, and more than anything, I wanted to know if uh, are we bringing new, uh, are we upgrading? Um, and then uh, in the face of staff reductions, how are we going to deal with, uh, with monitoring not only our regular campuses but the ones that are due to shut down given the fact that, you know, kids may not be there yet um, we do need to make sure that they don't get vandalized, that the copper doesn't get stolen, and so on and so forth. But nonetheless, it's, I mean, that's a component of a broader, comprehensive approach as to what are we doing with technology in the district. So currently we did receive, and, you know, Superintendent, please jump in when, you know, if you need to clarify, <clears throat> but we did receive a grant to do upgrades on our cameras at our sites to, um, from SAC PD, thank you very much. And in the bond, there is a technology component as well. And so we will be making upgrades to our safety, to parking, to fencing. And then for our close sites, we will have uh, security make sure to drive by. But they can see, they have a laptop that can actually see the site. So they can look at all the different sites and keep an eye on the site. And then uh, staff-wise, I mean, uh, how are we planning to kind of roll that over with technology and who's going to be monitoring and doing the, uh, the operating of the equipment and upgrading and, and the like? Um, that's our maintenance and operations staff. We'll upgrade, and then our technology department, they'll work collaboratively together to do the upgrades. So I guess I'm... I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, 
Superintendent, I don't Member know. Member Royal, I think part. You know, I think the question really is: is um, our, our our staffing and our capability to, to monitor and, and uh, patrol our sites? We've actually increased our ability to do that, and uh, in part in partnership with the SAC PD, we've uh, added security uh, resources so that we're moving more and more towards a, a 24 seven presence to be able to monitor our sites. And, uh, and, that, and that will continue. As far as sites that are, uh, that are closed, again, that's a 711 committee process and, and depending upon what happens with those sites, um, again, all of our sites now are, are patrolled on a regular basis and every site during a shift gets a visit from the security services. And then just to kind of conclude that piece, is there a, but is there an overall plan of what is it that we're doing as a district when it comes to this? Kind of, yeah. Yes. I mean, is there a document, or are we putting a working plan on how we're going to uh, move forward with our, not only our equipment, but also with our staffing for all this? I'm honestly not sure I understand your staffing question. If, 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 if I am understanding it, what I'm hearing from you is how are we going to provide visual attention to our vacant sites? Is that what I'm, I mean, am I it's, understanding? It's all inclusive, right? I mean, all I want to know, or mainly is, are we being thorough and thinking through how are we going to uh, roll out our plan? Uh, that includes all of those things, technology, upgrades, okay. staff, and so on and so forth, so that we can refer to it and say, are we on track, are we? So we currently, yes, we currently do have a, a technology plan that we're just finishing up. We're going to provide it to the cabinet on Monday, and then we can move it forward to the board as well. And that, in, and that includes the not only the infrastructure upgrade, but an upgrade to the devices and cameras and different stuff. We also have that in our maintenance and operation plan as well. They overlap, and they overlap with our safety. Okay, so there is one, and then so yes. I'll look forward to seeing it in the future. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and we, I, and we, I mean, we have assessments of every single one of our sites, and, the, and we... Because of the assessments, we were able to upgrade some of our equipment, our camera equipment. So we have, we have all that information that we can provide you. Each one of our sites has an assessment. It gives detail on what is needed. And then and, and I, first of all, wanted to say, uh, excuse my, I mean, I, I'm not in your shoes, so I don't know what you've been working on or not. And <laughs> so not knowing what to ask, you know, sometimes. We just want to make sure that we answer the right. Okay, I mean, right. we want to So a plan is forthcoming. And that, that's, you Correct, know, yes. that helps with that. Okay. And then um, on the walk, uh, walking routes, um, it has been uh, brought up by a couple of parents mm -hmm. as far as uh, there's the ideal, and that's kind of like the, uh, the goal and what we want to achieve. And as you go through the, as you went through the report, I mean, I think that there are very uh, thought out plans and ideas of what we want to do. But then as parents come and they're kind of telling us what is not or uh, what is or it's not working. It basically points out to some of the deficiencies as how we're moving forward and implementing these, um, either the closure process or the transition. And uh, so I'm still wary that um, we are not necessarily meeting the needs of the community. Uh, and so I, I really like the fact that parents are coming up and talking to us. I mean, I, I commend you for all the work that you do, uh, and you have to put your best foot forward, yet we definitely need to listen to the parents when things are not working. Um, I, I really don't want to continue this uh, closure and transition process with parents continuing to bring uh, comments of things not working, and either we're trying to kind of rush them off and not deal with them, and because it basically what it, it what, the way that it looks to me is that we just trying to shove it underneath the rug, and we are not necessarily right. very interested in, in really meeting their needs. Um, and so I, I really hope that as the weeks go by and the meetings you know, that we have and we get the updates as parents come up, um, I get it. It's very difficult to meet every single need and every single concern, but I mean, I think that some of these are recurring uh, issues. Uh, one of them is, for example, one of the parents coming and saying, you know, I was told that this was not going to be the plan. Nonetheless, it's already out there. Uh, so either there's mis miscommunication or we are not really following through with what we told parents we were going to do. So that's... So, Member Arroyo, I don't mean to interject, but I, I want you to know that we are continuing to reassess and reevaluate and adjust. 
And we do, we take notes and we look at all of the parent comments and we address them and we work with the site personnel as well as with the Sacramento PD to make sure that our kids are getting the most up to date because things do change. And so we continually evaluate, reassess, and readjust. And then we'll work um, to communicate those readjustments out to the parents. Yeah. And so you continue to hear from me. Uh, embrace the parents. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> They'll work with you. Yeah. And, the, you know, uh, we'll, we will be able to move forward a lot better. Um, a couple of questions, uh, Ms. Lopez or Mrs. Lopez. Like, Miss, Ms. Lopez. Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Mrs. Lopez, uh, on the safety committee, uh, you mentioned that it got reestablished, um, which is great. I just have a couple of really quick questions. Is how was it publicized and how do we uh, inform? I mean, is it open to more parents? Because I would like to know when, where it's meeting, and then really allow more parents and more stakeholders to be part of those conversations. I, oh, go ahead. I, I would love for that to happen. Uh, our next meeting is actually next Tuesday, I believe, and I can email you that date for sure. Mm -hmm. And then we also have another standing date in May, and we'll be meeting throughout the summer as well. And how did you publicize to go out there to recruit these st the stakeholders, at least as you mentioned them? You already have parents and students and, and so on and so forth, but I mean... You know, we, we had been at a couple of meetings prior to that, and there were people that expressed an interest, and so I reached out to those people. And we had partners, um, like I said, the fire department and emergency communications. Uh, there are some very active people in our school district. There were staff departments that were interested in participating, and those were the folks that we reached out to first. You make a very good point. I think it'd be great to publicize it. I think the more minds that we have at that table, the more beneficial that committee will be. And uh, if, and it, it's a mix, yes. Uh, sometimes too many minds, you know, you can talk forever. But nonetheless, but it will, uh, what I really want to make sure is that we get a good cross-section of people from throughout the district have an opportunity to be part of that dialogue. I think we're uh, on, I think, I really do think we're on our way for that. And so uh, if you can let me know later on sure. what schools we're reaching out to and how we're uh, putting the word out to them. Okay, okay. Um, on the training, as far as um, you mentioned, you're training all staff. I mean, I know that that's probably going to be a challenge because we are asking them to train on other stuff, uh, <laughs> like Common Core and and, and the like. Um, I don't know. Uh, nonetheless, uh, the item that I was more concerned about is you're, you're mentioning a video for parents. Mm -hmm. Now then again, how are we going to get it out to them? <laughs> it's going to be posted on our website. Okay. That was our initial, that's our initial plan. Okay. So we'll also work with our parent organizations and with our principals, some of our principals, in order to make sure that um, we can download it to a DVD if they don't have access to the internet. And then we'll provide it to the principals. So in their in their family resource centers, they can have it on the computer as well. Um, we, some principals have reached out to us, and we're actually doing on-site training for their volunteers and their parents. So we'll continue to do that specific site specific, as well as the the more global. Okay, thank you. Appreciate your work, uh, Member Rodriguez. Thank you. Um, I have questions about the fiscal aspect of this, um, but before we get there, uh, I want to talk about the, um, go back and circle back to the AED um, conversation. Um, you know, I think there is like the fire department or the, um, there's some, there's an organization out there that does the free training. And um, I've heard from uh, parents in the district that we do have these machines available, um, and when it comes to saving the life of a child, I think that we should really make that a high priority. Um, you know, and I really, and I appreciate Mrs. Lopez, I appreciate your answer. Um, so honest and so forth, right? And I, and I know with confidence that you're going to get that answer from the health department. So, um, but I just want to reemphasize that that machine is well, extremely Screen, extremely careful when it comes to the life of a child. We have I to totally agree. And, and, and as I stated earlier, the, the AED machines um, are overseen by our health services department. 
and any information uh, about those probably would be best coming from them. Yeah. And, and while you have the fire department on your um, safety committee, you might want to ask them. I, I know they, they're a little bit, they're a lot more experts than that. They, ask them where there's that free training at because uh, I know they'll, they'll have the answer. Um, fire department is awesome. Not the same. They are. Not the PD is. <laughs> the PD is awesome, just the same. But um, they do so much. Oh, that absolutely. We don't even realize. They're huge advocates. They are. Um, um, so, and then the other thing is about the emergency preparedness um, for the families. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, unlike um, board member Pritchett, um, I had a high school daughter that went to a private school, uh, and their emergency preparedness, um, they did it annually. And so they had a meeting with parents, and um, you know it was a mandatory meeting. And then they told us that we were uh, these were all the things that we were responsible responsible for. And then they kind of gave us a heads up on what we should expect for the year. And part of that was emergency preparedness. And um, they did this system. And it's um, I know that we had we used to have Zangle here, but they had a, a different system over there, Naviance and. Um, uh, do you remember Miss Teresa, what the other one was? Cassie? No. It was at St. Francis. Um, there was two systems. But anyway, um, one was for the student for, as they were um, going and navigating through the process to get to college, and then the other one was for both students, parents, teachers, um, to, uh -huh. to access the students. And so at any given point in the day, a parent could log in, find out where they're which class their daughter was in, um, and uh, if they attend it on time, tardy, or at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then if they completed their homework assignment for that, you know, that would, they were supposed to turn in that day. And so through that system, um, they were able to email us, the parents, um, in case in the event of an emergency that came up. At the same time, they also did a phone call. Mm -hmm. So they had like this one once a year thing that they did. Um, they made sure that all of us parents had that connectivity, um, you know, and they gave us feedback at the end of it. They said, you know, we contacted this many parents, uh, this many parents responded. We knew that we were responsible to respond, to, to give them a reply that we received that. So we might want to go through that kind of a system here. Um, St. Francis is always open to talking to everyone, especially about their best practices. So I, I would Definitely. recommend that. We're to always, you. We were, as I said in my presentation, we I, we look to other schools and other schools school districts for best practices. So that would be definitely something that we could look into. I know in our district we do have Connect Ed, mm -hmm. and that's utilized extensively to communicate with parents. Um, we also, you know, have some parents' email address email addresses, and I know that that's probably not as consistent as we wish it were. Um, but that would definitely be something to look into, and that's great. And I also know that with Zangle, uh, there is a parent portal that parents can get in and, and get certain information about what their child is doing in school. So, uh, you know, emerging in the, of those two things definitely could be beneficial. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, I thought I'd bring that up. Um, best practices, hey, doesn't stop just at the one school because, right. you know, we, we can't do it. I think we can, just have to find a way. Um, Member Rodriguez, if I can add that our uh, connected system also does allow for texting to families in case of emergency. Really? which schools have that ability as well. We don't use it on a regular basis because there's a cost potentially to families or to parents receiving the text, but we do have that capacity in case of emergency. I like that idea. Maybe we can ask when um, every year, you know, the parents, we have to fill out the um, emergency form for our children. Maybe we can ask on there, like, um, can you receive texts and would you, and for emergency purposes, can we um, send a text to you? Um, because I know with the... Um, with the Connect Ed, not a, I've, I've stood there and parents have been receiving Connect Ed phone calls. They're like, oh, there's a school again. And they'll hear the first couple of words and then they hang up. And, you know, and I tell them that's vital information that we should listen to as parents. Because, you know, somebody's taking the time to create that message. Um, so, so, yes, a text message, you can't miss it. It comes across your phone. Um, so it might be one of those things that we can modify for this next school year coming up. That's a great idea. I didn't even know you could do that. 
Yeah, in fact, some of our schools are already utilizing the texting function with ConnectEds. As you noted, they're asking parents permission. I think uh, Charlie Waters at Kate Carson has used that function for communicating with parents, not just mm -hmm. for emergencies, but also um, for general communication, the, the general communications tool. Um, but not all schools are using it yet, so it is something we can look at expanding. Yeah, I would say especially in those areas where, where social economically disadvantaged families, high population of those, I believe that most of the people have cell phones there, and that's the technology use, their entree into technology. So we should really be pushing that in those uh, environments as well. Our connected system also allows us the ability to um, to delineate between a, a promotional text, i.e. there's an upcoming parent event, and an emergency text, which means that, and the difference generally is that in the emergency text, oh, excuse me, an emergency call, um, the, the message will go to every phone number in a parent's contact, so their cell phone, their work, their home, to make sure that you know we reach them as quickly as possible. So our, we have a pretty powerful system at our disposal, and, and we're working with principals uh, annually to train them on what, what tools they have available to them. We should open it up. Thank you. Thank you for that information. Hi, I'm Lieutenant Hines. There's one thing I wanted to add to that. We had asked a communication supervisor to sit on the security committee because uh, basically reverse 911 has all of these capabilities. They can do the phone call. They can do the text message. If a school, if a particular school or the district wanted to open the phone numbers up to the police department and provide those numbers, we could do, it would be one push of a button and we could reach everybody. Um, we can also draw an area map around a particular address and send out that information as well. So that's why we had invited him to our security meeting to provide us more information so that we could research that. That's awesome technology right there. Can we write that down as part of our policy? Because that, that is, <laughs> that's great that the, uh, our SAC PD has that capability. I, I, I guarantee that our sheriff's department should have it just the same. We're actually the hub for many um, area agencies because of the technology that we have with that reverse 911 system. Wow, that's great. So you service the unincorporated and the, the city? I don't know about the county, but there are particular um, agencies that are actually contracting with us for that system. That's, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I think we should include that as well and take note and do what, do what we can to incorporate that in our safety plan. That's awesome, um, because it, it's so often that the neighbors around without children, but they live in that school uh, site vicinity, vicinity and, and uh, they require that information just the same, because a lot of us just Very go true. out there like, what's going on? Yeah, yeah. yes. Um, so thank you for that, for sharing that information. Um, now going on to my questions. <laughs> oh, I like how you step away. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so thank you, first of all, first for reestablishing the safety committee. It's unfortunate that um, we had to wait for an event for the safety committee to be reestablished, and this is going to be like my my little like um, bandwagon kind of thing here on this. I've asked for another committee for a budget committee to be established. I know that at some point on this board, there was a few people that did not believe in committees, but. Um, Dr. Hausman, who used to be our board member, you see, I when, remember. I, when I first got here, he said, Diana, the hefty, heavy lifting is done in our committees, and so you have to be willing to put the work into our committees, and then, and then we can inform the board as a whole outside of those committees. Um, and so when something came on into play, all these committees were abandoned, mm -hmm. and I don't understand why, um, why they were seen as such uneventful type of thing. So um, I appreciate that we are, do have it now. Um, but we used to have a board presence on those committees as well. Okay. And so um, I like that you have all of these stakeholders here, but a board member um, should be invited to be part of this board, this, this committee just the same. Because then when I would hear back when we had a safety committee, and I appreciate some attention up here from board members, um, but when we had questions in the past, um, or I got questions in the past about a safety issue from a parent, I would, I would always say, you know what, we have a board member that sits on that committee, and perhaps you can ask them if that's been a topic of discussion there. Um, and if not, you should ask when the next board meeting, uh, next, when the next committee meeting mm -hmm. is. Because that's where, like Dr. Hausman said, that's where all the heavy lifting gets done, and you um, hammer out policy and then bring it back to the board. Um, so I do believe in that. Um, 
So on the on terms of fiscal considerations, I don't know which one of you wants to answer that. Um, but on the last um, item that we had heard, it was uh, fiscal considerations and slash day or no, you know not at this time. And I see throughout this we have we're talking about grants. Um, we're you know we're talking about well, we're going to receive a grant. Um, and and so we have a question about grants on this program that you had mentioned. Um, are these fully funding the programs that are operating right now? Uh, Where's my notes? And I can tell you I can tell you which are and which are not. Uh, you are prepared. I like that. Well, they I live these grants. So <laughs> can you remind me what slide you had these grants on? Let's see. Thirteen? No. Slide thirteen. Eleven, maybe. There we go. No. Yes. All right. No, that's not it. That's not the grant slide. Sorry. That's you. Can you pull up, Gail, can you please pull up the grant slide? Grant funding utilized? Mm -hmm. yeah. There right. we go. There you go. Yeah. Back one. It. There we go. Thank you very much. All right. While the readiness and emergency management in schools grant funded a large portion um, of the activities, training, and equipment, and staffing, there was some matching funds, mostly in the way of uh, personnel and time. Uh, there, at the time, there was some match for accountability. Um, I don't have the grant in front of me. There was some match for accountability. There was some match for clerical. The Gang Violence Prevention Intervention Grant has not funded 100% of our gang violence prevention intervention folks for quite some time, and even when it did, there was a 10% match. Uh, the Secure Our Schools, oh yes, the Secure Our Schools Grant has a dollar for dollar match, which we will utilize mostly in the way of labor. Uh, the, the, the It's Up to All of Us Grant, the AU, IUAU Grant, um, there is no match on that one. And I don't believe there's a match on the Office of Traffic Safety Grant either. Great. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> and if you have any clarifications or changes after you leave. Um, you want, if you need an exact yeah. per, uh, percentage on the REMS grant, uh, I can get that to you, but I don't have it with me tonight. Email is fine. I, I, I really appreciate that. Thank you for being uh -huh. very prepared coming forward. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, Um, so going along the lines of fiscal considerations, um, and we're talking about closed schools, how much, estimate how much would it cost to, um, uh, for closed school on the security aspect? How much is it going to cost to make sure that that school is safe and secure and sound? As, part as, as, part, as far as supervision goes? Supervision in totality, whatever it takes. I don't know that that's a, a question that, um, you know, right now we patrol all of our sites. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, the security services in the course of, of their shift go by and check all of our sites. So it's, it's, it's just part of, of, of what we do. The alarm systems are armed at all of our sites. So it's... So are we, like, doing anything to build fences or anything like that around... Some of our campuses are a little bit more open. Is there any of that taken into consideration, or are we just kind of close sites or close sites? Right. So we'll def we'll make sure we'll work with maintenance and operation to make sure that all of our sites are secure. They are all alarmed, and they have they all have cameras, so the security officers have access to visually see them as well as drive by them. Our maintenance and operations staff, so we'll still continue to go by and and do the upkeep and the maintenance uh, on the sites. And, and our all of our alarms have 24-hour monitoring as well. Oh, I'm sorry. All of our alarms have 24-hour monitoring, monitoring as well. So when there is an alarm activation, um, if security is on, they are dispatched. If they are not on, um, if it's a school in the city, SAC PD responds. If it's a school in the county, Sacramento County Sheriff's Department responds. Thank you. 
Thank you. And I just want to thank SAC PD for their um, continued relationship with us. Thanks, um, Mr. Sheely, um, sitting so quietly in the audience back there. I thought you were going to come up here, but I thought I'd do a shout out to you too. Um, so thank you very much um, again for your continued partnership. I know that SAC PD does way more than just um, patrol our facilities. Um, they are very actively engaged with our student population, our parent population, and now with our safety committee. I want to thank you for your continued um, uh, partnership with us. And it goes go way over and beyond what your call of duty is. Thank you. We agree. Member Pritchett. Sorry, one thing that came up, really simple question. I was just curious in regards to monitoring, uh -huh. um, like on a weekend or of some sort. The reason why I ask is I live around the corner from an elementary school. Mm -hmm. One weekend we heard the alarm going off. Mm -hmm. And usually we hear them, we go check it out because, you know. Thank we're, you. Yeah, I mean, we, we're neighbors, right? We ask, we so, ask our neighbors uh, to help us. So we went down to the school. Uh -huh. After about 15, 20 minutes, the alarm went off. But there was a window broken, and there was glass all over the place. Mm -hmm. We tried to call the principal um, at the time. There, he was out of town, so he couldn't do much. He said, well, the, they've been called. But nobody came. My husband actually went and got a piece of plywood and screwed it to the window to make sure it was secured because we were worried about somebody trying to get through the window and cutting themselves on the glass right, or, or stealing from the classroom. Yeah. Um, okay. So I'm just curious, like... You said you have monitoring 24 hours. What's the process in for something like that? No, I was just going to say, you, um, typically, if, some, if a window is broken, the alarm goes off, and security is, for some reason, not on, the, the Astrosonics will call. We usually get a phone call to... And Tracy <laughs> or Barry Evac, who is our directors of facilities, and then they will send somebody out to make the repair. Okay. So I, I don't that know mean, what this, happened in that specific case, yeah. but that's but that's typically what happened. That is so the maybe protocol. this was just a fluky thing because we were out there for quite some time yeah. and nobody came. Yeah. yeah. Um, if I might suggest, if that ever happens again, and we actually try to make contact, I have day security try to make contact with neighbors of our schools. Um, we're in the process of creating another brochure to hand out to neighbors with ways to respond in case something like that happens. Um, if it goes off again, I encourage you to call 643-7444. Um, that telephone number is monitored 24 hours a day, either by our security services office or by our alarm monitoring company. And if we don't have anybody on and they aren't able to get one of our law enforcement partners out there, frankly, they call me. And then I connect immediately with Barry Eve Pack. And uh, we get somebody out there to, A, silence and reset the alarm, fix the window, do whatever it is that we need to do. Do we have pamphlets or anything that we hand out to the neighbors or like a flyer? Is there something that you can email me? The reason why I ask is I, I work very closely with the Rosemont Community Association, and there's a big community meeting happening on May 8th, I think it is. Okay. And I'm sure that this is going to come up because we've had some issues with some of our schools with our alarms going off in the middle of the night. So I'm sure that when is it the 28th? Gonna... I think it's May 8th. May 8th. I'll yeah. get it to you before then. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think we'll get it. To, we'll get it out to all board members, please. Okay. Yes. Uh, Vice President Kennedy. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, actually, whenever one of the schools in my neighborhood alarm goes off, I'm on speed dial for plenty of people. And I was just thinking I should put you on that speed <laughs> dial, Tracy. Thanks, Patrick. A <laughs> <Yeah. clears throat> um, couple of things. <laughs> One is uh, the reaction to Newtown. Um, I want to compliment you. Um, obviously, reaction is something that we all should do and need to do and reassess and all of that, but overreaction is something we don't need to do. Right. And uh, you know, at the, after it happened, everybody was practically talking about turning our schools back into prisons rather than open community uh, centers. And um, I think that the value really lies in the violent intruder training um, of the site personnel. And that, you know, rather than phys physical, there's some physical things we can do and we need to look at and evaluate. But the most important thing, and it seemed to be the case in Newtown, was the training of the um, staff 
and, <laughs> and how to deal with it properly. So kudos for recognizing that. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, the I actually had was going to ask that AED issue too, but that's been beaten to death. Um, you know, it, it it came in as a specific instance uh, is the the, the tragedy at uh, 58th and Fruit Ridge, um, but as an issue, a bigger issue, um, you know, I'll always take shots at city traffic whenever I have an opportunity, um, and and that's the, because you know I've I've worked with Council Member McCarty on that specific issue at 58th and Fruit Ridge, and he's been very helpful. Problem is, is that it's on a list; it's on a very long list. Um, does the city ever reach out to us as far as when they're prioritizing that list? And if they don't, how can we insert ourselves vocally in that process? That's a really good question. Uh, we've actually been working, my department has been working very, very closely this last year with uh, m most specifically city traffic engineers and traffic investigators. And they've met me and Lieutenant Hines out at many of our sites to address traffic issues in front of the school. What little I've learned about the process is that there are a set of guidelines um, that they have to follow when it comes to striping and signals and link between this and link between that. Um, I think the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Um, I, you know, I think we've learned that as neighborhood members. You know, when we want something done, the more contact we have with those that can get it done, the quicker it gets done. Quick being, oops, quick being um, a relative term. Right. Uh, but I do, I think that more contact that you can have with city traffic engineers about that particular location, the better off you're going to be. Um, you know, I know there's been discussion about a signal at 58th and Fruit Ridge. Um, there, I know that there is a signal at Ortega and Fruit Ridge, mm -hmm. and there's also a signal at Stockton and Fruit Ridge. Um, I don't know what their yeah what their deal is as far as I don't want to just you know signals. belabor one specific as much as that is an important one to me, and I'll continue to follow up on it. It's Good. more of a process thing, and are we plugged into their process? Or should we be as a district, and I don't mean as board members necessarily, but when they're when they are formulating their and when I was on the planning commission, you know, we'd approve it, but the staff actually puts it together for the most part. And when they're developing their priority list, are we being consulted formally as a process? I don't think so. Okay. That's the answer. I yeah, was. I don't think so. Formally as a process, no. Anecdotally, issue to issue, right. we we see one another frequently and they are very collaborative with us. Uh, another issue, uh, safety on schools, is water pressure uh, as far as four hydrants and so forth. We've got some of our older facilities, and I've been talking about this for many years. Um, and every time we go to a water district, uh, and there's a number of them in our jurisdiction, everybody points the finger as it's not us. Um, are we ever going to do anything to make sure that all of our districts have adequate water pressure? Uh, and it's not just our issue, it is the water districts as well, that we have adequate water so that we're assured that if there is a fire, we can actually do something about it. Yeah, so we are we are continuing to fight that the water battle in a multitude of ways. Um, one, by doing work ourselves and doing the upgrades that we did right, up, plumbing upgrades and irrigation upgrades into our bond for specific reasons. Whenever we... Um, do any modernization at our sites or add a portable? We de we continue to add you know fire hydrants and and look at our water, and then we engage our our various utility services. We have multiple for our water. We're just we're continuing. It's just a continual battle. And we we have our our resource conservation specialist and our green fellow Farrah McDill, who are also. Um, on track to help fight the battle as well. So we're trying to do as much as we can internally right. and then reach out externally. Well, I just want to say overall, um, you know, back in 2008 when Member Arroyo was on the, uh, the, the, the safety committee, I think he'll agree that, you know, we are light years ahead as far as comprehensive safety planning. And I want to thank you guys because that's your, 
Member Arroyo. Uh, thank you, President Cunio. Um, just a couple of points uh, and, a, and a question that I have. Uh, one of them is um, to uh, Board Member Pritchett's questions about the breaking and the response. Um, the only thing I'm going to say to that is, uh, yeah, about four years ago when I first came onto the board, I did a ride along uh, of the district, one of them during the day, one of them at night. And uh, the only thing I can recommend is if you can still do that, a lot of your questions will be answered. So it's a as great far experience. As, it's a great experience. Just so that you know what that is like. Um, then uh, the next thing is um, there is a, a piece of legislation going through the state legislature right now uh, that it looks pretty innocuous, but, you know, it had some troubles getting signed by the governor uh, last year. But it basically uh, it's regarding copper theft. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would like to present a, or ask for a resolution to come to the board and I can help uh, prepare it. But basically what it, it's what it does is and it means very significant to us is because we suffer through this a lot is for those people that uh, buy copper to pay by check so that there's a record as to who's selling the copper. <laughs> and so there was it was uh, an issue that kind of got hung up on some policy uh, nebulous issues. But nonetheless, the bottom line is that if we as a district can support issues like that, then hopefully we can mitigate a lot of the impacts going on. And I would be glad to uh, uh, bring the language and uh, help out and bring it to the board for support, um, uh, given the conversation we're having. And then the, uh, the one question that I have is, uh, do we know what our alarm response costs have been? Because I know that we have to pay when alarms go on. And so do we have an idea of what that is and <laughs> what it is for this year? You want to know? Yes. Last time I looked, it was at 40,000 plus, but we didn't, SAC PD has not billed you for it. For us, SAC PD. They should oh. maintain that policy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, because I know that, you know, it's, it's quite a bit, you know, uh, of money, and I just, uh, this is an issue that had come up in the past, and I just wanted to know. Uh, so we are not getting charged. Is this kind of like a bill that it's pending, or...? <laughs> There's actually a new city alarm, um, city code, in regards to, to businesses, and basically I'll need to get back to you after I do a little research, but technically you do have the bill that is pending, but we are not yeah, and pursuing it. It would be great if we, because uh, I mean, I think it's just part of the, the calculus of us knowing, you know, um, uh, what it is, given the fact that every time that there's an alarm, you guys respond and there's a, there's a fee that co comes along with that. Uh, I do want to add that that number is down fairly significantly. So do you have that information? Okay, so you want to talk about the what we're doing to mitigate the alarms, the false alarms? Yes. There are actually a couple of things we're doing to mitigate false alarms. Uh, every day when our officers um, or SAC PD or the Sheriff's Department goes out to an alarm, there's an alarm slip that is um, formulated by the alarm company. We get those via fax every morning. Um, our security officer sends an email to the site that includes the principal, myself, Teresa, Kent Jones, Barry Eve Pack, and the rest of the security officers, um, letting them know that it was an alarm, what the source of the alarm was, what the outcome of the alarm was, and uh, it helps us tell what's causing the alarms. That's, that's the first thing. Sometimes it's the motion sensor in the room, and, you know, we know our schools like to have things hanging from the ceilings because it's art and it looks good and it facilitates lessons and whatnot. Um, a lot of times when the HVAC goes on, it will jiggle a door enough that the alarms go off. So we're able to see what's causing a lot of those alarms and make corrections to it. Could be a faulty door latch. Um, it could be that windows are, are left open and then things blow around. So we're able to see what's causing a lot of those alarms. In addition to that, as we move to 24-7 uh, security coverage, the frequency with which law enforcement responds to those alarms is also going to be reduced because we will be responding to those alarms. So there will be no false alarm charges from law enforcement. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, no other comments. I appreciate all your hard work, and thanks for the presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Item uh, 9.4, 7-Eleven Committee Update. Um, information item, five-minute presentation, five-minute discussion. Vice President Kennedy. Do we have public comment on this one, Mr. Ross? Yeah, why don't we do that first? Yeah, might as well do that first. Or, or do you want to update first? Give them something to comment on. Oh, that would that'd be a good idea. <laughs> All right, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, yeah, just r real briefly, I just wanted to report back that uh, the ad hoc committee did meet uh, and what was uh, accomplished was the establishment of the application process. Uh, the applic It was decided by the committee that the application would consist of a, um, a description of what the 7-Eleven committee is, uh, the education code which calls for what categories are required to be fulfilled within the 7-Eleven committee. Uh, we added two questions to a, we asked for a resume, uh, of course the current contact information, and written responses to two questions. One is, why are you interested in serving the 7-Eleven committee, and were you personally impacted by the board's recent decision to close seven elementary schools next fall? Please explain. Uh, we agreed that it would be in, in uh, English, Spanish, and Hmong, and, uh, it, uh, and also that it would uh, go out to, uh, it would be online, uh, which it is, uh, for three weeks, uh, which it is now five, six days. Uh, it uh, would go out to the Community Advisory Committee, the District Advisory Council, the School Site Councils, District English Learner Advisory Committee, Gifted and Talented Education Advisory Committee, the Indian Education Parent Committee, and the Sacramento Council of PTAs, as well as the, it would go out as a uh, press release for public consumption and the press, and also part of eConnect, which I see that it did. I received it myself. Um, so that... That process is moving forward. It will be open. The application period will be open until May 3rd, at which time then uh, all the applications are going. Um, you're welcome, Ms. Ferguson, uh, is getting all of the applications and uh, will uh, then distribute them to the ad hoc committee members where we will uh, close ourselves away in a, in, a, in a high mountain retreat very far away and come out with... Uh, the best committee that could ever possibly be established. But we're going to deliberate on uh, what will make up either the 7 to 11 members uh, and make a proposal to the board, at which time it's up to the board to decide on the committee uh, makeup actual, uh, itself. Um, the, we will be, that was what was discussed. We, we will be meeting, and the other two members, please feel free. I'm just kicking it off. Um, next meetings. We'll be in, we expect that we will have a public meeting, publicly noticed our next meeting. Uh, this was the publicly noticed meeting for this process that I could actually get on anybody's calendars. But next we need to discuss not only who's going to be on it and how's that going to happen, but what is the process, what is the, you know, how, how is the committee, the 7-Eleven committee going to work and um, put together that, propo that proposal for the board as well. Um, at, at, this, that, this time, that's all I have to report. Public comment. We have one comment from Leo Bennett Cochon. Thank you, Patrick. Something for me to comment on. Uh, were there agendas and minutes? I wasn't clear, Patrick. Was there an agenda and minutes publicly available? Uh, there, was, there was not. There was not. There was not. But you're doing that in the future. Uh, this was the meeting. Yes, we are going Perfect. to have a publicly noticed meeting the next time. Yes. Thank you. All about improvement. Um, I won't worry about it as long as the thing doesn't. Anyway. Uh, Jeff, I've been quoting your words, and you're choosing not to respond. You have commented about the 7-Eleven committee, and... I think it's critical that the public hear your vision and how your vision changed. Because your quote said that we were going to go to the community and that schools and neighborhoods are vital for one another and that school closures negatively impact a committee. It's my perception shared by many that you've used your role as president 
to create basically a shock and awe campaign. You convinced the rest of the executive board. You got your fourth vote, and you're moving forward, four to three. This is a very difficult area, and four to three votes don't build community. I would hope you would find the leadership to be clear about the vision so that the 711 committee is able to proceed in a way that adds value. These are closed schools if we're not able to change enough votes, and they still are hubs of community. There's no way that you're going to be able to move all the programs. None of these buildings that you're thinking to fill with students are vacant. They all have programs in them. And so using some of these schools for their after-school programs, or early childhood, some way of keeping them a viable presence, I think would be an awesome thing for you to task your 7-Eleven committee to. I still don't understand why you decided, though, to close Joseph Bonheim, and I hope the 7-Eleven committee can address how schools with increasing enrollment that are cost-effective end up. The previous 7-Eleven committee, and I'll wrap it up, had a 10-point proposal to evaluate. You've been quoted publicly as saying it's much better to just use capacity. I hope the new 7-Eleven committee is able to return us to a rational set of values that doesn't create these kinds of outcomes. Thank you. And board member Rodriguez. Yes, I wanted to bring some clarity in terms of the meeting um, agreements that the 7-Eleven um, committee had um, agreed upon. Um, we did agree to meet on Tuesdays here at the Cerna Center, um, beginning with, uh, I want to say it was April 2nd. However, due to um, staff not um, being available because of vacations and, and whatnot, um, we were unable to fulfill that, um, that obligation that we had agreed upon. So just for full transparency purposes, we did um, have every intention of meeting um, once in the public um, and noticing that meeting before this notice was put out into the public. Um, so I wanted to bring that bit of clarification out. Um, we still do plan on meeting, um, and I hope it is still on a Tuesday, um, as we had agreed at 6 o'clock at the, here at the Cerna Center. We thought it was um, important to ensure that we had a meeting, a consistent meeting day and time. Um, we will establish, um, as soon as we can confirm our schedules, we will establish that first meeting um, to be noticed, and then every other week um, until we establish the uh, 7-Eleven committee, and then we'll only meet once a month after that, according to what we had agreed. Um, and if I, if I um, am saying anything um, outside of of that, then perhaps you can help me out. No, I, absolutely, you're not. You know, you're you're absolutely correct. Yeah. Um, and uh, I also want to point out that, and you know, it was a very productive meeting. Um, we came to agreement with all of these things pretty quickly. Um, and I do want to point out that looking at the past, as far as learning opportunities and growth, uh, this is the first time that there's been this kind of a comprehensive application process for the, any 7-Eleven committee that, that since I've been on the board. Before it was just board members putting forward names and we were kind of deciding them up here on the fly. Uh, this is actually very comprehensive going out to the public. So I think as far as transparency, um, we've done more than any board that I've been a part of. So. Okay. Thank you very much for that presentation, um, Vice President Kennedy Member Rodriguez. Item uh, 9.5, board development. It's an information item. Ten-minute presentation, a five-minute discussion, as was stated in the uh, packet we received. I met with uh, Dr. Paul Danzig and Danzig, sorry, and uh, board member Hansen approximately two, three weeks ago. And um, I've been approached and by board members, and we've talked as uh, board members about trying to look for some opportunities for development. And I thought it'd be a good idea if uh, the doctor came and uh, told us about uh, his his work and what he could offer. Great. Uh, thank you, President Cuneo, uh, members, and Superintendent Raymond for the opportunity of being here today. My name is Paul Danchek. I'm the Director of Executive Education in Sacramento. And I do have a handout if I might be able to pass it out or if someone on your staff could pass it out.
I want to do a couple things today, um, realizing that the time is getting late and want to be sensitive to your time as well. Um, just wanted to give you a brief overview of who we are, and I want to introduce my colleague at USC, uh, Dr. Bob Denhart. Bob, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, I'm Bob Denhart. I'm professor of public administration at the Price School of Public Policy at the University of Southern California in the Sacramento Center. Um, and I've had long experience in leadership development and city council effectiveness facilitation. And um, we were asked to present some information about those topics, and Paul is going to do that. Before we get started, I just wanted to thank you for your dedication and service to our community. Um, I can only imagine how underappreciated your positions are at times. Um, I just wanted to let you know that you are appreciated by many of us within the community. So thank you for doing what you do. Say that again. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to say it louder? Speak into the mic. Yeah. Sorry, is the mic on? And I'll second it. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you just came in every two weeks, just, you know, like at the beginning, probably, yeah, we would pay you just for that. <laughs> sure, we'll be your cheerleaders. Yeah, I really appreciate the way that you designed the session today, the open session, that is. Um, the first session this evening uh, began with the Men's Leadership Academy, and it really demonstrated two things I'm really passionate about. Um, leadership programs, certainly, um, but also USC. I don't know if you saw USC in, in their background, um, but certainly um, that's where my biases lie. Um, I've been working on leadership program development for public and nonprofit organizations for the last nine years, um, combined with Bob's experience with um, his work in Arizona particularly, and now in California. And we really bring about 50 years of experience of thinking about leadership program design and development, specifically towards uh, public organizations and thinking about how do we best serve our communities and how do we really create transformational organizations. Also at the USC Center in Sacramento, we have a Master's of Public Administration program and really leverage off our learning experiences on understanding how adults learn best. And it's not through a bunch of lectures, but through some experiential learning. And Superintendent Raymond, I can assure you that there won't be sand or wet showers um, inside of our leadership programs like you experience. Um, our programs are high energy and high impact. Um, when President Cuneo asked me to begin to think about it, the first thing I did was jump to the research, and that's part of where the academic experience comes into play, of seeing what the literature tells us about best practices. And there was one report that came out in 2011 talking about the direct relationship between professional development with school boards and student achievement. And I really found that article quite moving in thinking about the requirement um, that some states have, but other states don't have, and thinking about board development opportunities. Um, in California, we we're only able to find three specific examples um, that were currently in place, and you may have known of others, but from our basic research, we only found the three examples with the California School Board Association, and those were for new members, for the presidents, and for evaluations. Um, and those programs were generally smaller on scale. Where we see the best practices coming in with leadership program development is over a sustained period of time. So thinking about building off of past experiences and really engaging in a, to a facilitate conversation that changes our behaviors. Um, so our program designs, think about three different things. One is certainly an exchange of knowledge, but the, the, where we spend most of our energy is focused on shaping behaviors and changing attitudes. And how do we recognize that within ourselves? And how do we go back into our organizations and make a difference? And that's where we see the impact of our programs coming into play, of looking at these longitudinal studies with some of our long-term programs, of knowing that our design makes sustainable impacts within organizations itself. We just want to throw that out as a possible opportunity for your, your board to consider um, as you're thinking about professional development opportunities um, that we have been in Sacramento since 1971. Um, not me personally, but the USC has. Um, but we continue to engage our community and be a resource for our community. And that's one of our main missions of being in the state capitol. Um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have or um, discussions that might ensue. Thank you. Sure. Um, Member Arnish, you have specific Oh, we have a public comment, Mr. Ross. We have two comments on 9.5 from Leo bennett Cachon and Darlene Anderson. Oh, as a San Diego State graduate, I can't claim affinity in terms of universities, but as a native San Diegan, I can claim affinity to Sol Price. Uh, Sol Price was an awesome individual, and he made some real changes in San Diego, and he didn't close any schools. He invested in City Heights, he built new schools, 
he turned things around by adding support. And he had two quotes that I was able to pull up. One is, you don't always have to have all the answers. Sometimes it's important to ask the right questions. And I hope that's something you consider in your development process, because we keep saying there's too many questions out here in terms of school closures. And he also said, and Jeff, this is directed to you, we try to look at everything from the standpoint, is it being honest with the customer? We parents are your customers. It's usually recommended, Jeff, when the public engages you to look and nod, and therefore we feel engaged. Like Patrick, I appreciate that, Patrick. Thank you. Good modeling of engaged behavior. He could teach a class in this. I'm just twitchy. <laughs> <laughs> and you make jokes, too, and that I appreciate. Thank you. Darlene Anderson. I think a good model for board members would be to understand that they really need to communicate with the public. I asked some questions about board policy, and I expected to get an answer from the board president, who told me that they would respond to my question, yet I had no response. And I think that it is policies that drives districts' interests. And so when I asked the question about the policy that was written in the annual student rights handbook that said that children with disabilities prior to the school year would go to the Success Academy, and that's where they would be sent if, because they were high risk. I expected an answer because under that it was the board policy that referenced student discipline, suspension, expulsion but I got no response. And I think that that policy was written in 1987. And I believe that it's been really, you know, streamlined to where we have children of color and children with behavior issues or perceived issues, safety issues, going to Success Academy and, of course, the Accelerated Academy, which is really no academy at all. It is a program that was supported by board members where children get credits and they don't get social skills, yet they go to jail after high school graduation. I think the district needs to deal with the policies in this district that are hurting families in poverty. I think it is a conscious choice that we do not. And I think the district has a responsibility to understand myself and Leo Bennett also ran for school board. And I think that we have the kind of compassion for the public that needs to be sitting on that board and needs to be replacing some people who are sitting there now. Thank you. So um, just to be clear, my intent to... Um bring Paul forward um, was to just spark a discussion about whether this is a direction that the board wants to go in, uh, what makes sense um, to try to find some consensus if there is some in going forward. I thought there was a utility in board development um, and that it would in the long run assist us uh, to serve kids in, in a better, in a better way. Um, but I, I'm just looking for some, feedback from my fellow board members um, about the direction they want to go in. Board member Rodriguez. Thank you, President Cuneo. Um One comment before I start asking my questions and making my, my uh, comments here is that um, I would appreciate it that when members of the public come forward to address our board, um, it is not on, I, I know that we, many of us know each other off the dais, but when we're here, I would like to continue a professional environment by um, addressing our members of the board, either by member, vice president, president, and then their name after that, if so, if it would be so kind of you to do that. Um, uh, we do, that's the only little bit of respect that we, 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 uh, we should get um, because it is a difficult job 
um, being up here. So I just kindly ask for that um, request to be honored. Um, the other thing is, is that I just have a question for um, Danzig. Um, and uh, is, is this training intended to be free of charge to the district? Or um, is this a seeking a contract with the district? Uh, no, I mean, it, it, there will be charges associated okay. with it. And that's why I wanted to bring it out here to the, to the board members and have the discussion. Um, it would come out of our uh, board fund. Development, yes. Uh, correct. I, I have, um, you know, well, first let's try to get some consensus about what we want to do. And then I can address specific questions. Well, I think, questions. I think uh, before, yeah, we, before yeah. we reach consensus, sorry. I'm sorry. But before we reach consensus, we do need to know the financial aspect of um, of what we're dealing with here. Um, as the pa outgoing, or you know, as the past president, immediate past president, I had been asking for board development to take place. I asked my two vice presidents, who are now on the executive team, to um, to research this. Um, so this is not a new idea. Um, and so just, yes, I am aware that we have funds in our account to do this. Um, but I'm also aware that me as the individual board member who has always sought training, um, I have joined up with an organization outside of CSBA, um, which is called NALEO. Uh, and it's an acronym and it stands for National Association for Latino Appointed and Elected Officials. I have been questioned on this board in the past as to why I take trips um, and how I'm paying for this, and it's not through the district funds. Um, so, and it is through this organization that I belong to, and it is through that organization where I got this type of training. Um, I have extended the application out to other board members in the past. Um, it is a very nominal fee; it's a hundred dollars to join, and they um, once a year have a economic uh, summit, or not economic, I'm sorry, but an educational summit in Washington, D.C., where they pay for everything, your air, your hotel, and the training, and some of your food is included in that as well. Um, there's only been two board members up here that have taken up on that, and I'm sorry that I ask a lot of questions, but perhaps it's because of that training that I've taken. Um, so um, I, as far as policy I think it's great that we're going to be discussing policy in terms of how do we manage as a board and govern as a board. But when we're talking about that, I would like to also address this policy governance hybrid that we're calling coherent governance at the same time. I don't believe that that fits into this board. Um, as, as we move forward, I would like to really have an engaged and thorough discussion about that. Um, you know, I, it, it's been discussed on the board of the past. So uh, we have to um, also start discussing, um, you know, board interrelationships and um, how we move forward for off, of the, um, off of the vote, um, such as the one that split our board um, in, you know, these heavy-duty um, votes that come down, school closures or layoffs or whatever the topic may be. Um, because that's where we get boards divided and not united. And um, that's how we have to understand that it's an issue. And then we, we debrief in our own way, whichever way we do, and then we can move forward from there. Um, but it's kind of difficult when you have a wound in the community that still is not healed. So um, we have to understand that we, as example setters, um, as role models in the community and how we then have to display that into the community. Um, so um, in addition to that, um, nothing will take the place of ever, ever being engaged with the community. Um, we cannot have that ivory tower effect up at the um, ivory tower. We're making the decisions and then it's going to go down to the people and they're going to like it. Um, it's, I see our world as a reverse of that. The people tell us what we need to do. And then we look at policy and see where it needs to change to match the needs of the community. Um, so these are all just things that I would like to see happen in a board development, whether you guys do it or somebody else. 
Um, so so that's, the, that's what my desire would be um, as a starter to this conversation about board development. Um, and so because I think it will make everybody a better policymaker up here. Um, it will make everybody, um, you know, engage at a, lot, at a different level um, other than, you know, political. Because, yes, we got here through a campaign, but then what else? What's life after a campaign look like? So, um, and then the other thing is, Mr. Cuno, I mean, sorry, President Cuno, after I just got after a member of the public. <laughs> <laughs> that rule, sorry. Yeah, right away, right away. Don't even listen to my own stuff. Um, President Cuno, um, I would like to then open up, um, perhaps we can have um, a workshop, like maybe a special meeting or something like that, where we bring in um, others who other vendors or others in the community who are interested in working with our board. And maybe we don't stick ourselves to just one person for this or one vendor. Maybe because of the needs are so great in our board that we we grab onto different vendors for different reasons, as I laid out. Um, because, I mean, policy is policy, and I love it. We can learn it all day. Um, and But for the behavior part of it, we might need something a little bit more than what you guys can offer from that professional level. We might need that uh, vendor that's really into the psycho psychological part of it. So um, that's the other suggestion I would have. Maybe I'll respond? Yeah, please. And if you want to touch on the fiscal piece, too. Sure. Uh, I appreciate your comments, uh, Board Member Rodriguez, and thinking about the approach to our leadership programs. And perhaps I should have taken a half step back during my initial introduction to explain more about our programs and how we think about the design of them. And when we think about the design of our programs, they're tailored towards the organization in which we work. Um, so thinking about our partnering organization and having them directly involved with the curriculum design for the curriculum delivery when you're talking about um, perhaps bringing in other consultants or other experts into the mix. That's the way our model is really designed. Um, so it's not just academics um, presenting in the classroom. It's really bringing in the best practices from the field of leadership and thinking about it at a variety of capacities. For example, we work with one of our consultants who focuses on customer service in the public sector. And what does that mean? And using best practices in that type of dialogue um, for his presentation, I mean, ties it in directly towards a specific organization in which we work um, work with and thinking about the way that their organizations are reaching out to the public and community building. Um, so when you're talking about those types of examples, that's something that we take very serious and incorporate into our program design. It's really focused on best practices and realizing that my expertise in collaboration is different than Dr. Denhardt's expertise in uh, leadership, thinking about it from an organizational perspective and um, another consultant's expertise. For example, her focus is on um, influence and how do we influence others within the workplace as opposed to power. And those types of conversations don't happen with us individually. It happens with us collectively. Um, and that's how we approach the design process itself. And thinking about the models, and this ties into the fiscal question that you asked, well, we didn't run numbers because we don't know what you're looking for. Um, once we have a better idea of what you're looking for, we can put together a budget for you. And certainly that would be something that we could provide um, as an example of what a leadership program might cost. Um, our rates are low for the region. So thinking about USC, and there's a certain stigma attached to the university itself of thinking about Ivory Tower. But in Sacramento, we're very cost effective because we work with the public sector and nonprofit sectors. And we really want to make sure that we have the greatest impact for those organizations. Um, because of our design and our collective approach um, and our working with presenters on multiple programs, they present for us at a reduced cost and you could provide for them if you hired with them directly. So there's that factor that comes into play too. When thinking about leadership program design, um, this is where cost also comes into play, is thinking about the structure of the program itself, of whether or not it's over a multi-month period where there's accountability built into each of the sessions where they build upon each other, or if it's just a one-day session, and that would have a different cost um, implication to it. Thank you, and uh, we have other board members. Uh, Member Pritchett. Okay, <laughs> sure. <laughs> Yeah, Vice President Kennedy. Yeah, just real briefly, we went down this road a few years ago when uh, uh, Roy Grimes, and President Grimes, and uh, Member Bell and I were on the executive committee, and we actually met with 
another organization, another educational institution. And what we did was we met with them, kind of sat around with them on a couple of meetings and talked about what it is that we felt the needs were of the organization and what, you know, we would, and then they came back and, you know, talked about what they have to offer and what they could do. And, and they ended up putting together a proposal that was a good proposal um, that, uh, you know, showed here's where we think that we could serve you and that type of thing. And with it came a price, which is why we actually never did it. Um, because the price was just, it was just astronomically too high. Um, and, and I'm not faulting them for that. Um, but, uh, I, I think that, you know, we went into it, to be honest with you, as an organization with, we offered them a chance to be partners with us. And our definition of partner was free. And, um, I, I think that's certainly unreasonable. Uh, and so, you know, I welcome this because I think that, that any board and this board is no different, uh, would benefit from this, whether it's your services or someone else's. So if we were to go down this, I mean, I wouldn't mind, you know, I, I'd love to see a proposal from you guys. I mean, your reputation, you know, precedes you. And so, I, you know, I, I, I would welcome that opportunity, but others maybe as well and look at the proposals and as a board decide what we think would fit our needs best and what's within the realms of our realistic ability as far as financially and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, Member Arroyo. Thank you, President Acuna. I just want to really want to get to the nitty gritty. Okay, uh, yes, uh, Vice President Kennedy, a proposal will be great. Uh, I really want to get to the uh, point where we evaluate what you're presenting or what you're planning to cover uh, not, I, I guess a, an agenda would be too simple, but I guess a curriculum, I guess, of what the items you're planning to cover. Uh, obviously, I really don't think we're going to sit down here and try to hash out exactly what model and what program and what vendor and so on and so forth, but I would really like to see then a proposal so that we can weigh it out and figure out if that's um, um, the, the, the model, I guess, that you know we want to go with. Um, I'm completely open and willing and interested in doing uh, board development and uh, if uh, there are I just want to uh, see a curriculum that kind of fits where we're trying to go and obviously that's what you're trying to assess and so I think that you sit in here for I don't know how many hours <laughs> it may be uh, agenda time management we're, <laughs> we're working somewhere in there um, nonetheless um, we will. Uh, I, I'm. I'm really interested in figuring out, and uh, you, not only yours, but any uh, other uh, options. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks. May I respond? Oh yeah, please feel free. One of the things that would be helpful from us, and thinking about us as a potential deliverer of the leadership program itself, is some parameters, and certainly that would be um, some sort of um, thing that you would consider when you're applying or sending it out to bid um, to other vendors as well, is putting in some sort of parameter of what you're looking for, I mean, even if it's the time schedule. So if you know you have a certain deliverable or you're trying to hit a certain earmark at a certain point in time, um, to know how many days of programming um, you're thinking about as a board itself. And if there's financial numbers that you know that you can't hit above a certain number and you're willing to share that, that also helps shape the curriculum design as well. Um, so it's not working towards the number, but it's keeping it in consideration as we're designing the program itself. There's some factors that come into play, for example, of coaching, so individual coaching, um, and that would have a different cost structure than if we just had a group presentation. Um, so knowing what type of uh, program that you're looking for um, would be helpful. Thank you, and, and I was going to say this uh, half-jokingly, but I'm actually kind of serious in the sense that uh, vendors or people that might be interested in, in getting our business. I, I thought it as a joke at first, you know, given the fact that you've been here for so long, but I think that the essence of asking a, a somebody to sit here and watch the board dynamic for, for an evening uh, will probably give you a very good insight as far as, um, you know, what kind of range of uh, uh, topics we could probably cover or, or benefit from. I mean, as I said, it, it, it was going to be a joke at first. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Or, or, or withdraw their bid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But nonetheless, it's, it's something to consider. And uh, I, I, I'm very much looking forward to hearing back from you guys and uh, anybody else. Thank we you. have been taking notes this evening. <laughs> uh, I was just going to say that Member Kennedy's um, recollection of the past process strikes me as a good one. 
Uh, that is the chance to sit down with council members or board members and talk about what you're interested in achieving as really the first step that we would want to take. And indeed, to go back in the other direction, you're issuing an RFP for board development would probably be the way to solicit something from us or something from other vendors. And so you might think about that approach as well. I'd like to interrupt. Uh, we need to uh, like to make a motion to extend the time of the meeting uh, until 1045. I'll second. I'll second. You should do 11. I just did 1045. Safe. I'll second. Um, all in favor of extending the meeting until 1045? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. How many uh, public comments do we have from the next item? Well, let's keep talking about this. M Member Hanson. You, you held up a lot in, in Member Hanson. minutes. Oh, okay. Member, Member Argus, please. Well, I, w I wanted to say thank you for being here for four hours and waiting patiently for your turn. Uh, I, I know that that was a valuable, uh, a valuable assessment of taking a look at board dynamics. Obviously, every board is different. I know you've got a lot of experience working with different boards and the state legislatures and you know all the different things that USC does. Uh, and I think that we would benefit um, well from that. And I think it'd be a valuable investment for the school district and for the students and the parents and the taxpayers of the district. Um, just you know, for myself at the California Medical Association, we had a long uh, six-day session with our top 25 staff uh, over the course of three months. We did two you know, three two-day sessions, and it made a gigantic difference in the operation of our association and the camaraderie that we, you know, identified and trying to find common goals. I think that would be, you know, very valuable for us to look at doing something like that, you know, regardless of the, of who we choose. You know, these folks obviously are very, very reputable, but to be able to do that with the board and senior staff, I think would be very valuable. And, you know, I appreciate you making the presentation and, um, I hope that we consider it, and I'd love to talk about it, and I think it'd be something worth putting an RFP out for. Uh, Member Rodriguez. Thank you. Um, I think that we're not going to have enough time because we have another agenda item. Um, but I said all of the stuff that I said up front to have a conversation starter. Um, not to down this at all, but I want a conversation starter about the needs of this board, um, the needs of what, you know, at least lay down some of what we're feeling up here. And I think I was being open about um, my feelings about what it was that we needed. Um, I would then ask now our um, board president to bring back an agenda item just to discuss board development, what it is that we want. These conversations need to happen in public. Um, and so let's bring it back. Let's talk about what it is that we want. Um, I was hoping that we were gonna have that conversation right now, but I guess not. Um, so, and then we can get to the RFP, RFP process and whatnot. I don't, I don't see the benefit of having the discussion in a vacuum. We need, we need to know what can be offered um, and then have the discussion of whether it fits the needs of what we want. So to just simply talk about abstractly where we think we're weak or strong, I don't think makes a ton of sense. I think what you want to see is an RFP process where people come to us and say this is what we can offer and then I would come back to the board and say, okay, this is what I have. What, do you, what does the board want to do? How does it meet the needs of the board? I, I think that's the smartest way to go. Mm, I think you kind of, you, you need to guide your RFP responders um, somewhat, somehow. You need to develop some type of guiding principle. Um, and, and I think we, we should bring it back for more conversation um, before we put it out there for an RFP. Um, I don't want to talk this issue to death. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I understand we have differences of opinion up here on things. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> go ahead. No, but no, I, I, quick, I, uh, quick question, just a very quick question. So what would help you, would it help uh, have some kind of opinion even from the executive committee or the entire board, give you some direction, some parameters? You mentioned that earlier. Yes. I mean, so I, I would be, what I hear from the board is this is something we want to do. We're interested. So what I was going to do is take the next steps. Either I can do an RFP. I have no problem doing an RFP. I also would, I could sit down with Paul and his team and bring f forward whatever options they give us and have the board discuss the options, adopt one, or outright reject all of, any of them. Would it, would it help you to get some feedback prior to the RFP being put together? 
Uh, you're asking. I'm wait, sorry. Wait, wait, let him answer the question. I'm, I'm sorry, but this is this is actually feeling very uncomfortable Rodriguez. to me right now because we're asking one vendor and we're Remember giving Rodriguez, one vendor the let advantage. Him, let him answer the question. I'm, I'm really okay. sorry. This is very illegal to do right now. Uh, let me respond from uh, a provider's perspective and taking USC out of it. Um, when I'm looking at RS, RFPs and. And Bob and I do this quite a bit of thinking about um, RFPs that come across our desk and things that we apply for and things that we don't apply for. The things that we look for are basic things that I think the board um, could help provide guidance on. For example, um, who would be part of the training? So thinking about whether it's just the executive committee or whether it's the council and the senior team of staff members that are part of it, knowing that type of structure is helpful in responding to an RFP and thinking about what a leadership program might look like. Um, knowing who the audience is and uh, knowing the time frame would be helpful uh, whether it's a one-day type of event whether it's multi-day events may whether it's over a series of a certain number of months um, that type of information is helpful in the RFP process um, to get us started and thinking about responses um, and sometimes um, those types of proposals that's enough information for us as experts to be able to respond and say, well, our experience with board development has been X, Y, and Z, and this is what we can provide given those parameters that you gave to us. Um, so even thinking about it in a broader perspective, so not as USC as one vendor, but putting it out into a larger RFP process, knowing what some of those structural components are would be helpful. So uh, bottom line is I hear uh, an answer that includes both President Cuneo's and uh, board member Rodriguez's points all included all in one. And my only suggestion is a conversation on the side between the two, meeting of the minds, and then we move forward. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I just <laughs> I, I, I think that what I would like to recommend is that uh, we go forward with an RFP. Um, and let's be careful about throwing the word illegal around because it's not, and that, that has legal consequence. Um, but... <clears throat> We go forward with an RFP, and within that RFP, and this happens all the time, when people respond to RFPs, they have an opportunity to meet with those that send out the RFP in order to better reply to it. Uh, within that RFP, uh, there would be an opportunity for any uh, one that wants to bid on this project uh, to meet with two or three board members. I would certainly recommend that it be, uh, at the very least, President Cuneo and Member Rodriguez, um, and uh, in order to better flesh out what the proposal will be. You can't make a proposal in the dark. Um, you have a pretty good idea of your expertise and what you've seen tonight, but that's not good enough. So you need more, and so does anyone else who would bid on it. But an RFP that would do that, I, I would recommend that this be put on a, this is an information item. We can't do anything tonight anyway and that a process like that be outlined and be put on a future, uh, near future agenda as, a, as an action item to adopt the process and the RFP. And, and I would commit to working with Member Rodriguez on the issue. So I, I would be happy to sit down and, and develop uh, more guidelines along the lines of uh, Member Arroyo's suggestion. Thank you. Great. I Thank appreciate you. all your time and, and waiting. <laughs> we'll go back and take some more notes. <laughs> Uh, all right. Uh, 9.6, coherent governance operational expectations. 9, OE9, communicating with the public monitoring board. It's a conference and action item. Superintendent Raymond. Thank you, President Cuneo. I refer to the summary that's in the board packet, coherent governance policy, operational expectations. 9, OE9, communicating with the public. And I will um, entertain any questions that board members may have about the, the report that's been put together as well as the accompanying documents as supporting evidence. Please, Mr. Ross. We have three public comments on 9.6 from Leo bennett Koshan, Darlene Anderson, and Terrence Gladney. If we're going to get formal, I'm community member bennett Cochon, and I prefer trustee. So I'm going to call you trustee Rodriguez. Um, I'm here to address strategic two-way dialogue. My training is public administration, and you heard a comment earlier about how some of us are upset. And my training in public administration says that that's a comment to take critically, because in an organization that's people-driven and that's loosely coupled, a small number that are upset, even if we are wrong, undermines where we're trying to go. And that's why we need strategic two-way dialogue. 
So no disrespect, Superintendent Raymond, but the pieces that were shared for Washington are propaganda. Capacity that represents 14 permanent buildings and 10 portables without the useful life, and you look over the enrollment, that capacity has never been touched. What's that say for a design element except to try to illustrate, oh, it's way under capacity. It's not connected to reality. It is not a two-way dialogue. I contrast that to Theodore Judah, which bottomed out, but then was given support, had ideas, was able to climb back again. We go over and over your annual cuts. I have no idea if you're responsible, if you get it from staff, but cuts from proposals are not real cuts. And you can't have cuts that look like that that gen generate an increasing expenditure line. So in the California Department of Ed, there's been one decrease, and that was in the year where you did generate the $43 million, but that's the only dip. The budget's going to have to be balanced. And yet you don't show that the budget you approved increased books and supplies by $10 million. Thank you very much. And did a 0.28 reserve for $1.1 million. If we could finish up, please. Two more. You state that Proposition 30 saved us this year. Emphasis, bold. Later on, not at Washington, you'll let us know that Proposition 30 also gave us $10 million for the coming year. If we could finish, please. Yeah, just the last one. You're over the two minutes, sir. Hey, I can have three minutes with Kevin Johnson, so hopefully now and then I could have two here. <laughs> but anyway, um, it states the class sizes remain this, I mean, sorry, uh, fewer split classes, and yet there's only one of the schools that are being closed that has closed uh, split classes, six of them. Everybody else has zero or one. Thank you for your patience. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Darlene Anderson. My goodness, we are talking about coherent governance, and we are talking, we are not talking about student achievement. We are not talking about where the children are actually scoring in this district. Many of them are below the 25th percentile, and I really don't believe families understand when you have school sites that are scoring at 8, 3, 17, 18, 20, what that really means the number of children who are proficient at each school site. I think when board members get on this board, they look at the glamour of holding a public office and they promise their friends contracts. Therefore, people can come up and do presentations, the one like we just heard, which reminds me somewhat of mafia type behavior because board members get on here and say what they're going to do. And they vote four to three. And guess what? The public gets screwed. They don't care if your baby has to get up at five o'clock in the morning and get on a bus because they're right. How does it feel to be so righteous up there making the decisions that are going to hurt families in Sacramento? And quite frankly, you don't give a damn if kids are making are getting a proper education because you've taken care of that. You've ensured that kids are going to get a piece of paper that said that they got a high school diploma when they can't even get a job in Sacramento. People left Sacramento more than 20 years ago for opening position jobs simply because Sacramento was not graduating kids at the level to put kids into opening job levels. I mean, that happened from the Department of Commerce. But you don't have the Department of Commerce in here talking about job development. No, you don't partner with anybody except for yourselves. I think the problem is that we don't have enough community members involved in the public education. They are not your partners to the extent where you are opening up the doors and allowing up, them please. to see student achievement. 
And I think that it is accountability that we are looking for. And I think the, I think the public has a right to have board members that oversee the public trust. And I think that you really need to understand that the public trust is trusting your children in the hands of people who are going to ensure they give them a proper education. And I do not mean giving contracts to contractors in no manner. If we could and I understand please. you understand where I'm coming from. None of this but, has to do with OE9, ma'am. Pardon me? Nothing that you said has to do with OE9, so could we finish up, please? Nothing has to do... We're on coherent governance, not... Oh, I understand, coherent governance. That's what you guys established. I didn't establish that. We're talking about student achievement, we're talking about how children and families are doing, and you're looking at how the superintendent actually is documenting the value. And that's what I'm saying. Well, governance is overseeing policies, right? Policies implemented to educate children in this district. And that's what I'm talking about. You may not be talking about it, but I am. Thank you, and have a good evening. Yeah, what, what's the pleasure? Just a moment. What, what's the pleasure of the board? How many? We have We have two more comments on this item and two more comments on subsequent items. You want to make the motion? I move that we have to, uh, we, we have to suspend the rules first. I move to suspend the rules. I'll second. All those in favor of suspending the rules, say aye. 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 No. No. Well, wait. Opposed? Who's opposed? Member Rodriguez? And Kennedy. Member Kennedy? Or Vice President Kennedy? Anyone else? So we don't, that would mean we do. We need five. <clears throat> Mr. Board Member Hansen, Pritchard, do you vote to suspend the rules? Okay. Yes, Vice President Will? Okay. And uh, all those, and then I'll move to 11, 11 p.m. Okay. All, all those in favor of 11 p.m.? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Please go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Terrence Gladney. Um, I just want to speak to the process. Um, this whole process of self-evaluation, I mean, it's akin to a student only submitting their best work or, you know, a basketball player only counting the shots that are made. You know, I, I don't think that that's the education that we want for our kids. I don't think that that is a sporting event that we would like to watch, you know, where everything is successful. Um, I think that, you know, we, we understand that, you know, true growth and true learning comes through, you know, recognizing and, and, and growing from the challenges that we face. And, you know, I think that that's a problem if that's the way that you guys are, as a board are going to evaluate the performance of, you know, the, the district. You know, that being said, um, you know, I, I think that the district has an opportunity, even though, you know, by no fault of their own, this is what you guys are allowing them to do. You know, I think that organizational transformation, you know, would be, you know, to take it a step further and say that although these are the things that we're accountable for, even though there's no metrics to say, okay, you know, this many people were communicated with, you know, what are the metrics you guys are looking for? A 90% response rate or just that communication went out? You know, two-way communication means what was the response to the communication that went out, and I don't see that in this report. Um, I do see a lot of one-way communication, you know, telling parents what I guess is perceived to be what they want to hear, um, you know, what the capacity numbers are, um, you know, what's going to be the, on this superintendent's agenda, you know, but what's not here is, you know, some really good two-way communication that has existed, you know, between PTA and, and between parents. But, you know, what's also not here is the challenges, and, and that, I think it would be a great opportunity to include some of those, you know, how those challenges were faced, how they were overcome, because they're lessons for all of us, you know, how we can better work together. But if it's just going to be, hey, this is what we did, you know, let's paint a rosy picture, we know that's not the case. You know, you guys get up here and say how much money has been cut, you know, what have we done in light of those cuts and how have we overcome it? That's how we learn. So I would like to see a more comprehensive report to reflect the communication that goes on between uh, the district and stakeholders. Thank you. Our final comment is from Jessica Ariaga. Good evening, board members. I'm sure you're glad to hear it's the final comment, right? Um, I just wanted to let you know as board members and superintendent, you, you guys lead the examples of communication. It is 
it is critical that the public gets the correct information timely and efficiently. And when a parent or a school site asks question after question after question, and, and those questions started when the school closure started, and we are no closer to having any of those answers. I, I, at the last transition meeting, I specifically indicated the next meeting, I want some definitive dates. I want to know if you don't have the answer, I want the date of when I can have an answer. Um, and this is the lack of communication that I'm getting from, from all levels. And I want to hold your district staff and I want to hold superintendent and board members accountable. But I can't hold anybody accountable as long as they say, oh, we'll get back to you on that. And I still haven't gotten back to you on that. So I really wanted to let you guys know, you guys are examples. And I feel like a child who says, we'll do that later. We'll do that later. We'll get to you later. And never, later never comes. And I'm here to let you know that later has to come because when these schools are closed, there's no later. When that, school's board, when that school starts in September, we don't have later. And I don't want to be on the first day of school letting what happen. Well, I asked the question. I never got the answer. And I know that that isn't your goal. And so I'm imploring you and I'm letting you know that communication from upper to lower to down to the parents just isn't working efficiently within your district. And I really hope you address that in some forum. Thank you for your time. Board Member Hanson. Yes, I first just want to thank Terrence. You usually have very thoughtful comments, so thank you for making a thoughtful comment and a constructive comment. That's always appreciated. Uh, and I think it's a good suggestion to, you know, for this item to include uh, communication with our the public groups that we work with on a consistent basis, like the PTSA. Um, I guess, you know, part of when I'm thinking about communicating with the public, uh, maybe we haven't done a good enough job because we haven't talked about some incredible things that have happened. And if none of the speakers who are here uh, mentioned that our chronic absence rate, which was just noticed just a, a week ago, dropped from 18% to 11.5%. That's a 33% decrease in one year. That's remarkable. Or that our graduation rates are now 79.8%. We increased 5.2%, the largest increase in the entire region, and we're now above the statewide average. Is that good enough? No, we got to keep going, keep going places, but we've seen some tremendous growth. So, you know, I like talking about positive things, so I'm going to mention that. Those are very positive notes. Uh, a couple days ago, I went to McClatchy High School and got to spend uh, a couple hours there during the day, and I saw their meeting of their Law and Public Policy Academy, and they had over 30 mentors from the community where they are donating their time, individually mentoring the students and talking to them about what kind of jobs they want to do in the future. Over 30 people that were lawyers, judges, other folks, giving their time to the students. They did a great job. I was very proud to see that. That was wonderful. Um, another very positive thing, actual people in the community, actual parents, you know, students that are growing and doing excellent things. So congratulations to the district for that. And uh, then just today, I went to Latata Floyd and joined them on a home visit to actually go meet with parents, with the teacher, to talk with, uh, you know, meet their students in their own home, talk about what their hopes and dreams are for their student, what the students' hopes and dreams are. It was a really transformative experience for me. So once again, I appreciate that and uh, want to talk about the good things the district's doing. And when I talk to parents out in the community, they tell me about the good things that are happening. So... That's wonderful. I know some of the people that seem to be our, our primary three or four speakers here on every item don't always see eye to eye like that, but that's why I need to go out to the community and actually meet other folks to see what's happening. Helps keep me positive and uh, grounded and know that I'm doing things the right way and our district's moving and doing positive things, so I want to compliment that. There's always things we can do better, and I like hearing constructive criticism that gives us some good direction, and that's what I'd encourage uh, when folks are going to you know, invest their time and ours in the comments. And uh, I hope that that's the direction we go in. So I know this is on coherent government and communicating with the public. So that's the kind of stuff that I, I'd like to see happening and keep communicating with the public. Thank you. Member, no, yes, Member Pritchett. 
I just wanted to also mention that uh, President Cuno and I have been uh, talking about possibly having a board rep on parent groups such as the SAC Council PTA as well um, to keep that that conversation going with our parent groups. Um, yes, I, I'll, I'll say two, a couple things. Um, I, I think I'll take the points that uh, Terrence made. Uh, I think it's very difficult to measure authentic engagement. It's a very kind of nebulous thing that depends upon a lot of different factors, right? And it's a two-way conversation that's very hard to kind of pinpoint the quality of. But I take your comments. I thought they were very good comments. Um, the second thing, though, about, you know, measuring, I, I mean, it's our job to measure how he does. I, I don't think it's a, a, you know, chicken ruling the hen house sort of thing. I, I mean, he presents his case of why he thinks he has met or exceeded the objectives that we set down for him, and, and we judge him on it. Um, just like we do on everything. So, um, but for what it's worth, uh, I, I do think authentic engagement is is the um, idea that we're after, and and how we get there is is a is a difficult um, difficult conversation, but one that needs to happen. So I will move um, the item from conference to action. Second. We have a second by Vice President Kennedy. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. You're opposed? Okay. Opposed, um, Member Arroyo um, abstentions. We have uh, Member Rodriguez absent. I will move um, the item that uh, OE9 is in compliance. Second. Second by Vice President Kennedy. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No opposed? <laughs> Do you want to be opposed to the action item as well? Okay. Opposed? <laughs> no, I thought you did. <laughs> Member Arroyo. I know it's late. Um, Member Arroyo is opposed. Uh, abstentions? None. Absent is Member Rodriguez. Um, item. Sorry, I lost my agenda. Item 10.0, business and financial information. We have a public comment. Comment on 10.1 from Leo bennett Cochon. Yield back my time because of my death. Item 11.0. Mr. bennett are you going to yell back this time as well? Or? Wish I could. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll stay under the two. This was actually for Trustee Rodriguez, but she had brought up about Washington. And so these are just general comments since I've been here more than you guys sometimes in the years past. But we used to have somebody on the board who would write down questions from the public and then get answers back to us, and that was a good process in terms of two-way engagement. And then also requests for agenda items had a, a sheet they were written on, and it got reported back. And so just those are thoughts that I thought from the past helped this process flow so that we don't drop things and feel like, why did that get said and then didn't get covered? So it used to be a vice president's job, second vice president, I think, Terry, memory. <laughs> Is that why it went away? <laughs> Thank you. Oh, right. Okay. Um, uh, item 11.0, future board meetings, May 2nd, 2013, 4.30 p.m. closed session, 6.30 p.m. open session here at the Cerna Center, May 16th, 4.30 p.m. closed session, 6.30 p.m. open session here at the Cerna Center. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn by student member E, a second by... 